starting live video. Trying to reconnect, Catherine. We're good. Hey, everybody. My name is Craig Gravina. We're here at the New York State Museum. I work at the New York State Museum. Uh, and I know that there's been some of these videos that have been going out recently. I've been talking to a lot of historians and scientists and curators. I am not any of those. I'm an exhibition designer. And I'm going to run you through our Ice Ages exhibit and talk about how exhibits come together and why the uh, designers and the production staff and everybody that works here makes the decisions that we make. So let's rock and roll. So right now we're standing in front of our, I don't want to turn to the camera, we're standing in front of our title wall. And this is sort of, um, it's a good way to jump off on the beginning of the exhibit and it's also a good way to jump off about how the exhibit comes together. So there's a whole crew of people in the exhibits department, actually throughout the museum, that work together to come up with uh, what our exhibit's about. A lot of times uh, our exhibits are based on artifacts that we have. We don't do a lot of exhibits on things that we don't have because we'd have to go out and get them and we'd have to collect them. We do borrow from, uh, from other institutions, but generally speaking, we like to do our exhibits based on the collections that we have here at the New York State Museum, and we've got a lot of stuff. Um, in the case of this exhibit, um, it started off with our uh, invertebrate paleontologist and our geologist working with an exhibit planner to come up with what the exhibit's about, right? That's how the whole thing kind of kicks off. We need to talk about our themes. We need to, you know, we just can't throw stuff up and say, this is an exhibit. We want to tell a story, right? The, the part of, of us presenting exhibits to the public is that we are telling a story about our artifacts. So the exhibit planners, work together with the content providers, and content can either be scientists or historians. Um, uh, even, you know, sometimes we have ideas that come in from the public occasionally that we do exhibits for, or other lending institutions and museums. We do that as well. Um, so the story gets put together, and it's basically like a movie. A script is put together about what the content providers and the educational staff want to talk about. You know, we are part of the New York State Education Department. So we like to adhere to New York State educational standards as much as we can. We like to throw in some extra stuff too. So once the script is developed, it comes to <clears throat> myself and our graphic designers. Our graphic designers deal with our two-dimensional space, our exhibit panels and our um, imagery. And I deal with the three-dimensional space. I deal with objects, artifacts, and specimens. Um, oh my. So why don't we get into um, the exhibit itself and we'll talk a little bit about it. So this exhibit, uh, once, it, once the, the themes and the topics were developed with uh, the content providers, was we basically wanted to tell the story of how glaciation and ice changed the landscape of New York in you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago and how that, the, the effect of the ice on the land over time as it, as it receded, uh, the landscape changed and we got different kinds of animals into this area. So because our geologists and our paleontologists have a whole bunch of different objects and artifacts in their collections, we wanted to use those to tell the story. And the first wave of the story starts in the gallery in this blue area. And we'll talk about our murals in a minute. But I wanted to talk about the color, right? So we have three sort of phases that New York goes through in its post-glaciation period. We've got this blue area where it's still cold, glacier's a big giant sheet of ice, and then we wanted to move into as that glacier moved back and what was left, and had how over time small plants, plants and shrubs appeared. And we decided we were gonna go from a blue area to a red area, so we could delineate different um, different moments in time. And from our red area, we moved over to our boreal forest area, our green area. So myself and the, and the graphic designer had a few meetings and we talked about what we wanted to do on, uh, on how to differentiate these three sort of topic areas. And that, that's really our, our first jumping off point is to talk about the coloring. Now we also talked with our, uh, our geologist first because the first part of the story is to talk about how the glaciers actually affected the land. And we have these really neat artifacts. These things are called erratics. And they're, you, kind of, you can kind of think of them as like a, um, uh, the grit on sandpaper. If the glacier itself was um, 
like sandpaper. This is the different grit. So we have big ones like this here, we've got some smaller ones over here, and then we've got some finer grain sands. And this is one of the things that we wanted to talk about. This is a big rock. These are smaller rocks. There are things in museums you can touch and things in museums you can't touch. We wanted to make sure that there was some parts of these opportunity for us to do this. So people can come into the museum and touch this. Now if we turn around, and we'll talk about him later, we've got the, these artifacts behind glass because obviously we don't want people touching these. So we need to figure out a way to uh, show these objects but still keep them protected. Because whereas telling a story is part of our job, we also really have to be cognizant about making sure that all of our objects and all of our specimens are um, protected. So our geologist said, I want to tell the story of glaciation. I've got this cool stuff. What do you think? Do you think we can tell some stories with it? Yeah, but we had to figure out a way of tying all everything together. We said, hmm, well, we've got a color scheme already figured out. And we have, uh, we've got some of these cool objects over here. What can we do? And that's when we started talking about actually showing some of the environments of what New York looked like hundreds of thousands of years ago whether it was a glaciated environment, whether it was a tundra environment, or whether it was a boreal forest environment. And we were lucky enough to come across a, a woman, her name is Beth Zeichen. She is an illustrator and she did all of these, she doesn't work for the New York State Museum, um, but she did all of these wonderful illustrations that you can see with the exception of the glaciation. One of our graphic designers actually did this, but he manipulated this photo in Photoshop to match her artwork. So the green images and the orange images were done by Beth, and the blue glaciated image was done by uh, one of our graphic designers here, uh, Ben Karras Nix. Karen Glaze also worked on this project. She was another one of our, of our graphic designers. So I've been mentioning the terminology objects, artifacts, and specimens. And I like to differentiate um, what that stuff is depending on the topic of the exhibit that I'm working for. And the way that I usually look at it is um, anything that's scientific, like a rock or a mammoth skull or um, a, a, a fossil, um, I like to refer to those as specimens. All right. I know that if I'm talking about a specimen, I'm talking about something that's, that uh, scientific research is done on continuously here at New York State Museum. We have specimens that are 150 years old that genealogists, uh, are, yeah, yeah, genealogists are coming in and um, geneticists, excuse me, not genealogists, geneticists are coming in and they take a look at it and they're taking samples and they're using the New York State Museum as a research tool in and of itself. If we talk about an object, I like to think of objects as being um, man-made, historic objects, like we have in our historical collection. Chairs, cars, you name it. Stoneware, we have all kinds of stuff in the New York State Museum. And then our artifacts are something that could be man-made, but are usually unearthed in an archaeological excavation. We have a huge anthropological and archaeological collection, uh, and a lot of the Native American uh, artifacts as well here in the New York State Museum. And we use those objects, artifacts, and specimens to help tell our story. Those are the specialties of our historians and our curators. I have to come in with our exhibit design or exhibit graphic designers and our planners to come in and tell the story um, using those objects as sort of the star of a movie. So you can kind of think of me as almost like a set designer. Um, so as we move through here, um, we can talk a little bit more about uh, why we chose what we did in, in some of these murals. And we can take a look at some of the, uh, the specimens that we, we, we have as well. So when we worked with Beth, uh, it wasn't just me working with her. It wasn't just me like acting as an art director. Uh, Bob Frannick, who is our uh, uh, vertebrate paleontologist here at the State Museum. Um, she did a few sketches for us. We talked about what kind of animals would have been in this environment. Um, the really unique one here is the, is the, the, the mammoth that we can see in the background. Um, we have muskox and reindeer, uh, caribou. Uh, but we were talking about what the environment looked like. And we actually got into some pretty granular 
pun intended, uh, conversations about like what would the rocks have been when Beth uh, initially sent us her, her first round of sketches, the rocks were very round. And Bob was saying, you know, this is right after the glaciation had sort of pulled out, so our rocks need to be angular, you know. So we try to, if we're doing mural, if we're doing an illustration, even if we're doing uh, regular graphics in some of this stuff, we try to be as accurate as we can for the information that we're trying to convey or the information that we have at, at, at any given time. So it was sort of a back and forth on that. Um, we have in our collection, we have some modern animals um, that have come from zoos. And if you, Albert, if you want to pull this over here, you can take a look at it. We have with our, with the back of our mammoth skull, we also have a caribou skull and a, uh, a musk, musk ox skull. And some of the things that we need to talk about too is we want, you know, we want our specimens to be at a certain height. Um, so that um, anyone can see them, from a child, someone in a wheelchair, an adult, is that it's at a good viewing height. Um, and we have um, exhibition labels that go along with it to give it a little background information on, on what you're looking at. Um, and sometimes we, you know, we need to create a mount that has a little bit of aesthetic value too, but doesn't take away from the, uh, the specimen itself. Let's go take a look at our boreal forest area. So as um, the glacier pulled away, we had that tundra environment where we were looking at our mammoths. Um, and tundra environments are like what you would find in, in Alaska, in northern, very, the northern part of Alaska, the northern part of Asia. Our boreal forest environments are more like you would see in sort of the high peaks region of New York. Um, we have a lot of specimens from, uh, from this period. We've got um, giant sloth, we have our mastodon, giant beaver, condor, uh, our, our pickeries, and our stag moose. We had to figure out a way that we were going to be able to show all of this relatively large, these relatively large specimens, and we came up with this idea of, of, uh, of this big long display behind the glass. And when we were talking to Beth, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is that we could place our artifacts, our, our specimens rather, um, with the, uh, the animals themselves. And what, we wanted people to understand what these animals looked like and how the scale of, of how big they were. Um, we also spoke with um, our ornithologist and asked him, you know, what kind of animals, what kind of birds would have been uh, around when mastodons and giant beavers were around. So he, we've got a, an, an oil up there. There's some sort of duck over there. I'm not quite sure what that is, but um, we also will occasionally um, use reproductions. Um, in this case, the New York State Museum does have a giant beaver skull, and it is, uh, it's a very, very fragile artifact. Um, so right here, we actually have a comparison of a real beaver skull, not a real, but a, a modern beaver skull, with a cast of a giant beaver skull. So this is a reproduction, there's a company out there that makes reproduction objects and artifacts. And in this case, um, the cast was actually made from the New York State Museum's um, be a giant beaver skull years ago. So it worked out perfect. So even though that this is not the one that we have in our collections all the time, it is a, it's, a, it's a very close copy to it. So this exhibit sort of goes hand in hand with our um, Cohoes mastodon. The Cohoes mastodon would have lived in this period. Um, we have a comparison over here of uh, a mastodon femur and, a, and a, uh, a mammoth femur and a human femur to show the differences in the kinds of animals. That's a, that's a big question that we get here. What is the difference between a mammoth and a mastodon? You'll have to come down to the New York State Museum when we're open and find that out or talk to Dr. Bob Varanik. But before we uh, sort of wrap up here, I wanted to give another shout out to another important part of the exhibition process and development. We have the planners and the designers that work together, but our production department is uh, really unique in the world of museums. Our production department built everything in this space. Um, there's not too many museums anymore that have the capabilities to build bases and cases and mounts. We have some really, really talented people involved with the, the construction 
and the uh, installation of our exhibits here. And here's a little secret too you might not know. Back there where it says what is a tundra and what is a boreal forest, that blue box is actually a door and that's our secret hideaway to the production department. So behind there are a, a, a team of, uh, of really craftsmen um, who, who have essentially built everything that you see in the New York State Museum. We do have occasionally uh, uh, um, times that we need to send stuff out to have fabricated, but I would say that 99% of the stuff that's made uh, and put on display uh, is made here. It's printed here. Um, we did all the printing for uh, the, the wall murals in-house. Um, we do all of our own framing. We do we, the, the it, it, working for the New York State Museum Exhibitions Department is really is a really uh, fantastic opportunity. Any questions coming, Albert? You're not supposed to be shaking your head that way. Gina, do you have any questions? No. If you have any questions, please feel free to text them in, email them in, in the midst of of my presentation. Yes, if not now, on our Facebook page later. I will uh, make sure to take a look and see if anybody asks any questions and I will answer questions. <laughs> Gina's laughing over there in the background. <laughs> Do you have any questions? No, you don't have any questions either. Thank you, Gordon. You're welcome. Are we good? Is there anything else I can do for you guys? There are people eager to see it in person, so thank you very much. All right. Thank you.